All right, y'all, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Buenas tardes. I'm Roxana Pardo Garcia. Um, I'm on the consulting team that worked together with the Communities of Opportunity Learning Community to put together Cultivating Community, a speaker series. Thank you all so much for being with us this evening on this lovely summer day. I hope that you are relaxing, that you're in a comfortable place. Um, and thank you so much for coming and journeying with us through this conversation. Um, I now hand it off to Kai uh, to do the rest of the welcoming. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Roxana. Um, it has really been a pleasure to work with Roxana and the design team um, to get this speaker series planned. Today, before we start, I want to take a few moments for us to acknowledge the people and the land who we stand on today. I want to acknowledge and honor the Duwamish and Coast Salish tribes, the first people of Seattle and King County. I honor the people past and present and offer gratitude to the land itself. So we are here today um, in our first speaker series session. This speaker series is a part of our learning community strategy. And this learning community strategy is an opportunity for us to learn build and share across communities, sectors, and geography so that we can amplify our movement towards a more just and equitable King County. This speaker series is um, our inaugural kickoff session today. And I'm really excited that we're here with some of our founding members of Communities of Opportunity. Um, I am not gonna take long because we are really here to hear from them. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, you have the option to ask questions and um, we will be monitoring those questions and posing them back to um, our facilitator team. Um, and we might be responding to some of them in the chat. Um, I also um, want us to just take a moment um, for us to kind of center I actually just picked up the pizza for my kids and like threw it at them. So I'm a little like short of breath from that. I'm imagining that many of you are also navigating many things. So as we settle in um, to this story, when Roxana was designing the speaker series, she talked about the journey. And so today it really is about a storytelling opportunity of our journey of um, how COO started and where we're at right now. Um, so as we settle into this story, I'll ask you to take a moment and um, settle into your bodies, settle into something that you notice. Maybe it's the warm air of the Seattle summer. I'm noticing the sounds of my kids upstairs. So maybe it's a smell. If we can just take a few moments, take a few breaths for us to settle in. And to be as present as we can as we're listening to these stories. We know that life is happening all around us. So uh, take care of yourselves. Um, this will be recorded so you can come back to it if you miss a portion of it. Um, but we're really so grateful for all of our panelists today, uh, for our design team, and for all of you who are spending this warm Thursday evening with us. Um, so I actually have the opportunity now to hand this over to our moderator and one of the original team members of Communities of Opportunity and my friend, Erin Robertson from the Seattle Foundation. Um, take it on, Erin. Thanks, Kai. Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Robertson, as Kai said. I'm the Managing Director of Policy and Civic Engagement at Seattle Foundation. And as Kai acknowledged, I was one of the original staff helping support, build, and work with the community leaders around shaping COO. I uh, will be at Seattle Foundation only for a couple more weeks. So tonight is a little bit of my swan song, getting to celebrate and say goodbye to communities of opportunity. And I'm really excited to be with a group of amazing leaders telling the story of COO. With us today at the panel, we have C. Lisa Vusa, the Executive Director of the White Center Community Development Association. C. Lee was one of the initial community leaders on the design committee for COO, helping shape what this was gonna be and how we thought about it and rooted it in community. Uh, then came back to COO as a, a governance group member representing 
the White Center community on the governance group. We also have Michael Brown, the Chief Architect of Civic Commons at Seattle Foundation. Michael was one of the founders of COO, representing Seattle Foundation, pushing a funder to partner with community and government in new ways and put our resources behind this. Uh, and finally, we have AJ McClure, Executive Director of Goal with Local. And AJ's actually played a few different roles in COO. Initially, at the start of Communities of Opportunity, AJ was on staff at the county and worked on helping form this initiative. Uh, he's since stepped away, taken on a leadership role within Global to Local, and is now on a governance group representing SeaTac Tequila and helping inform and drive the strategy of this initiative moving forward. So thrilled to have all of them here. Before we get into our conversation with the panel, uh, we're going to have a short video from Tony Toe. Director Emeritus and Othello Square Project Director at Homesite, who like Seeley has held a long-term role in the community, helping shape and guide COO on the governance group. We actually don't have the video, so I'm gonna roll us right into conversation with the governance, or with our panel from the governance group. Uh, so, I'm fortunate to be here with Celie and AJ and Michael. All of us have worked together for more than a decade and know each other well. So uh, I know no one on this call has any issue being candid or speaking truth, but really hoping for a, a frank and open dialogue and encourage you to you know, be real with your comments and what's moving forward for you. So to kick us off, I just wanna ask, you know, how are you? How has the last, been, how has the last year been for you for your communities, for your organizations. Uh, Celie, I can see you laughing at me through, uh, through my little box. So I'm, I'm gonna turn it to you first and uh, just share a little bit with us about how you're doing. Mute. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm too busy laughing. Um, How are you doing, Celie? How's the last year been? <laughs> I'm doing good. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, Celie's on there. Um, you know, I think like everybody else, you know, who would have thought we'd be, we'd be in a pandemic, you know, all of us. And, um, you know, I think we all know, all of us, all of you who are on this call, um, uh, you know, it's, it's made life really interesting the last year. And so um, in the last two years, but, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm doing good. Uh, you know, this is one of the, this is a, a great time to challenge ourselves um, to figure out how we can be better partners. How can we build strong relationships? And um, I'm just really blessed to be where I am and COO, having COO around and being in it has been really helpful to the White Center story. So, so yeah, doing great. A little thirsty. <laughs> uh, coming to us from White Center yeah, as an unincorporated area, that's a lot of services and supports that some of our, our cities in King County have that you all don't have access to. What does that look like in the, the face of the last year? Well, you know, Unincorporated King County Urban, us, Skyway, um, you know, not having a local municipality during a time like this has really helped um, pushed us to be creative about how we support each other, about how we do the work, but um, also to be really um, direct and transparent about this is what the challenge really is for us. And so, um, you know, the, the getting the community involved in the work that's happening here in White Center and in all over King County, uh, I think is the best way to help support um, and, and do the work. And, the, um, you know, the relationships uh, are really critical uh, for unincorporated King County, the relationships that we have with not only funders, with local government, but also with our partner organizations. And so um, I just, you know, I feel that we have a lot of the right people um, that surround this work 
and um, using COO as a strategy to align what we know is important to our communities um, has been one of the goals of our of our collective work um, as governance, but also as COO broadly. Thanks, Ely. Right, Michael, I'm going to turn to you next. So welcome to the panel. Appreciate having you here. It, share with us just a little bit about how you're doing and how you've been holding up. So Aaron, you said you want to can it, right? Like, you know, kind of, you know. So um, I don't know about the rest of you, but it's been a shitty freaking year. And I actually censored myself on it. Um, I will say, um, you know, in the spirit of, um, you know, trying to layer some optimism in, I mean, I think it, it's taught us a lot about resiliency um, that, you know, we, we could go through a, a challenging year plus and, you know, we still have some work to do, but, you know, make it out on, on the other side, but also something about transformation. And I think there's, and, and, you know, I think there's kind of personal transformation, but I think in, you know, kind of in spirit of tonight's conversation about community transformation, that um, a light, and it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic because, you know, all of us knew, you know, the challenges that many of our communities have faced for, for so long, um, but the, a light that was, um, uh, became became visible in terms of some you know the true inequities, the structural inequities that have always been in place. Um, on one hand, I want to say it gives me hope that um, um, those who were ignorant of of that fact um, might actually step up and and be partners with us in terms of furthering the work. Um, and at the same time, I'm jaded enough to also say I'm not going to hold my breath on it. Um, but the work that we have been doing, the community empowerment work, the building work, um, remains so important. Um, so while it's been a shitty year, um, when I think about what's to come, you know, I actually do have some, some hope and some optimism that we together can actually move um, a lot of the shared goals and values that we have forward. Michael, you come to this conversation, you know, representing a funder and in particularly have a role of bringing folks together across sectors within Civic Commons. How have the, the challenges of the last year kind of shifted how you think about your role within that space? That's a great question, Aaron. And um, we'd say in particular, the bridge building across sectors, um, which is really kind of the, 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 the work that I do is so critical. Um, in this partnership that of COO, it has been the public sector, in particular King County, the philanthropic sector, in particular Seattle Foundation, and then community. But I think there's a, once again, a great opportunity to expand that partnership and how do we bridge, or once, and once again, around some shared values. What do we want this region to be? Do we really want equity? Do we want to have an equitable region where everyone can thrive and prosper? And if so, then it does require some new partnerships and, and um, involvement from other jurisdictions outside of King County and other philanthropic institutions, you know, outside of Seattle Foundation, and frankly, you know, the public sector or the private sector as well. So um, the, the work that I've done and, or, and have been doing over the past year um, has actually been heightened by this. Um, and I think we, we, the collective we of COO have been building a narrative that now I think others are starting to buy into. Um, now the next step is actually getting their true partnership with community still being the lead to help move move this thing forward. Thanks, Michael. All right, AJ, I'm coming to you next. Uh, big surprise. Uh, how have you been doing? Share with the, the audience just a little bit about what the last year's been like. Yeah, um, I, I too will be frank in that, um, you know, it, it is, it's been, it's been a very difficult year, as most of all of us can attest to. I think for, for me, you know, um, 
but professionally, like at, at global to local, it, it's been a huge challenge in terms of uh, reorient, reorienting our programming. Um, you know, so much of our work from the, the coalition work to our services we provided the community was all in person. And so having to shift away from that um, was incredibly challenging. Um, and, and mostly the impact on our staff, really, um, because they are, they are from the community, they are connected to their community, um, and not being able to have that, it was, it was really hard to see our staff kind of navigate that. Um, so, and, and, and it's, you know, we were slowly coming out of it, but it's still something I think a lot of our staff is dealing with. Um, me personally, um, I'll be honest, like, three, four months in, I was having a really hard time um, just being isolated, having to work from this room in my house and having my kids at home in school. Um, as Kai said, you know, life happens, comes at you in a lot of different ways. And so I was having a really tough time. Um, but because of my community and, and my community and our, and our organization and my family, I, you know, obviously I, I came out through it um, on the other side and, and, and much to what Michael was saying, I think the seeing how our community and how ourselves individually can be resilient to this, um, this is the hardest thing I think we've ever had to deal with, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and we're all still here. And I think in some ways we're a lot stronger because we persevered. Um, and, and I think for SeaTac and Tukwila, you know, even in the midst of it, when things were really bad, um, our community rallied together um, and, and distributed, you know, thousands of meals, you know, and that that was just quickly came together because of the relationships we had um, and the and the shared goal we have of serving our community and putting our community first. And that was a really kind of example of hope in the midst of when we were kind of in the in this, you know, lockdown. Um, so that, that gave me hope. And, and I feel that um, it, was a, it was a year of great reflection in a lot of ways in that, again, to Michael's point that we were, we were able to take some time and have some time to ourselves um, to really think about what do we individually, how do we individually contribute to the work that we're doing? Um, and I, and I, I, that's probably one of my biggest takeaways, um, and, and really the, the affirmation that all this sh stuff we were doing, um, before the COVID, um, we were on the right track, right? I mean, you know, in terms of trying to build healthier communities, the things that we were pushing for related to housing, related to food access, related to you know, connection to our community, the sense of belonging. Those are all things that we need to do, um, COVID or no COVID. Um, and so seeing all that, um, how, how greatly needed that was in the pandemic, um, it was affirmation that we are, we are headed down the right path. We just got to keep forging forward. Well, thank you all. I appreciate the openness of the dialogue and conversation and, you know, listening to all of you, hearing both the kind of hardship of the last year, as well as, you know, the things that bring hope and seeing folks come together to, to tackle this collectively. You know, AJ, I, I had my kind of follow-up question built for you, and you sort of answered that in your, uh, in your description. So I'm just going to kind of keep us moving, but do appreciate what you brought forward. So I now want to turn a little bit towards just the history of COO. And, um, you know, we're many years into this initiative and effort and would love to just go back to the beginning. And I'm curious, you know, what you all remember from that point in time, you know, who was there, what were we doing, uh, kind of why, why this all came together. And, you know, Michael is kind of one of the founders and the, um, you know, there for the very genesis of this idea. I'd love for you to kick it off. And then I'm going to uh, turn to Celia and AJ to point out all the things that you forgot and got wrong. <laughs> and, you know, what this, you know, funder thought they were doing that uh, they really had no idea. Uh, um, I, I would expect AJ and Celia to definitely fill in planks along the way. Um, 
So this goes back to about 2012. And at the time, there were, there were two parallel tracks that were occurring. Within Seattle Foundation, we had just gone through a, a very transformative shift where we shuttered our um, longstanding grant-making program, which was essentially um, supporting many organizations across what at the time, what we call our healthy community framework, um, but maybe not having the type of impact that we wanted to have in the, in the community. So we, we jettisoned that grant making program and decided we were going to reimagine how we were doing grant making. Um, we, we were uh, super focused and super clear about our intentionality around um, achieving racial equity and economic equity. We were clear that um, getting to root cause was the way of solving problems. So we were going to invest in upstream approaches that policy and system change was really critical. We, and we had shied away from it for many years, but we knew that investing in policy and system change could get us to um, significant impacts in the community much faster. But most importantly, we knew that we couldn't do this alone in our ivory tower, that we had to enter into co-design of our initiatives and strategies with community. And as a community foundation, while we had very strong ties and relationships with community partners across the region, um, entering in, into a co-design phase was, was different. So we were embarking on that path and, and came to the conclusion that investing in place would be a good start. Um, and for us at the time, economic opportunity was where we, we had built a lot of knowledge and um, we thought it would be a really good place for us to be. <clears throat> the same time, our colleagues at King County um, were going through their own transformation plan. Uh, the Department of so uh, Social and Human Services and Public Health um, built a, a very elaborate partnership with um, many stakeholders and with the executive and were clear about a new path in terms of how the county was going to utilize their funding. And then at the same time, utilizing data they had available, they were going to, they were really interested in doing some place-based work as well within health and housing. Um, so it just so happened that we started talking with each other and we were talking about the very same geographical areas, South Seattle and South King County. Unfortunately, the two uh, parts of our region that had the greatest inequities in health, housing, and economic opportunity, um, where we're seeing um, um, increasing gentrification and displacement, and where we're seeing more people of color and low-income communities um, uh, move, move to. So as we started to think about this partnership, one of the things that became really clear, and, and thankfully both Seattle Foundation and the county were on the same page uh, around this. Normally what would happen is funders would say, hey, we want to do something to help community X, Y, Z. So we're going to um, go into our, our, our ivory tower, come up with the best research that we can, internally talk about our strategies. Maybe we'll do a focus group at, you know, in community to get some additional information to justify what we think we should do. And then we'll develop the initiative. And then we'll drop an RFP, a request for proposals in community, forcing community to respond to what we want them to do. And then act surprised when we don't get the outcomes that we expect to get. Um, so needless to say, that approach from funders, including Seattle Foundation, never worked. It never got us to anything close to what we want. So if we're in a spirit of transformation, well, why not do something different? Um, and having some really good partners at the county, we, we decided we're gonna flip this upside down, that we knew what our goals were, what, you know, what we wanted to achieve, but we knew that we were not the best people to develop the strategies. So we decided, hey, what would this look like if we actually did this in partnership, true partnership with community? 
where we as funders could actually let go, where we as funders could share power, where we as funders could actually lean on community to develop strategies they knew were best to achieve the goals within health, housing, and economic opportunity for, that, for their community. So I'll, I'll actually stop there, Aaron, because I think then for Seely and AJ, you know, this is where it becomes a, a more interesting story. Yeah. Well, AJ, I mean, you were working with the county at this point in time. What do you remember around the impetus for this initiative and um, you know, the, the whole desire between, you know, partnering with a funder and with community in terms of building this? Yeah. Um, no, it was, um, I'm going to put, put Seely on blast here because one of my original, um, you know, original memories of, of all this, we were sitting um, at, um, you know, in her building in one of those meeting rooms. And I remember it was one of the first co-design meetings. Uh, Aaron, I think you were there. I think, Michael, you were there too. Um, we were sitting around the table and I think we just, either the county or the Seattle Foundation gave its kind of first spiel about what we're trying to do. And, you know, no one knew what, I mean, we all had the words, but we didn't really know what the hell we were envisioning or doing. And Celie's first response was, would you guys just quit effing with us? <laughs> first, first, that was, because it was like silence, right? And then that was the first comment. And I was, I think I was probably two months into the position and I had just come from King County Council. I worked, I was working there for a while. And I remember I was probably like sitting in the back. And then when she, when she said that my, my head just went like, and I was like looking around and seeing like, how are people going to react here? Um, and I was just thinking, okay, now this is going to be a fun job, right? Like this is, <laughs> this is more like it. Right. Um, and, um, but I mean, I think that's indicative of, of what it was, right? I mean, it was, it was creating a place for a community to be that open and outspoken. And frankly, for the, for the powers that be, the foundation and county, to take it and say, hey, look, we hear you. We maybe don't know how to react yet, but you're speaking the truth and we need to change things. Um, so, you know, and I think that that's, that set the tone in a lot of ways for how we were going to engage because at the root of all this, the governance group, uh, the co-design meetings, EAG, even just our one-on-one -on -one interactions, we got to be truthful. We right. got it. We, and we got to build trust. Right. Um, and if we don't have those things in this, none of this really matters. Yeah. And, and so it was, it was basically setting a new context, a new, like a new game and how we were going to engage with one another. Um, because at that out, at the outset, and, and, and a lot of people who are on this, and we all know too, that, you know, the, the relationship between the county or government, local government and community is, is, was not good. The history there, there's there's a lot of distrust. Um, there's a lot of top down, and so we as COO had to had to just break that down and and start over. And so um, I remember my job at the county was doing a lot of. I was out out in the field a lot, talking to community organizations and people um, in South King and around where we wanted to do the work. And just starting those conversations and understanding where that where the distrust was, why the distrust was there, and how to how to, just listening really, um, and then learning how we were going to repair that uh, to get to the to the place where we wanted to be. And we're we're you know we're a lot better where we were, but that's that's obviously work that has to continue, right? We're never really there, right. you know. Michael's great. The people at the county are great. Um, but, you know, those people change, right? And so this is about institutional change, right? Um, and cultural change. And so um, that's that's what I'm most proud of um, and what I was most proud of when I was when I was at the county. And then I, now as I transitioned 
into this role, I, you know, I'm proud to be affiliated with SEAL because of that, because um, that was, that was transformative um, in a lot of ways. And all it took was a couple of cuss words from Sealy. So that's, <laughs> there's, the, there's the recipe. Whatever. <laughs> no, well, actually, and, and, and AJ, AJ's right. And so, I mean, obviously many of us know Sealy. So like, you know, if you, cut, you know, curse words from Sealy, but then also kind of like the threatening of your life is <laughs> also kind of like a very motivating thing to not screw this up. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, the, um, those of you who know me know I'm born and raised in Seattle. My parents um, were active in the Samoan community. And so, you know, I had uh, I had the fortunate um, experience of also working in local government, city of Seattle. So, but what was always, um, I think all, what I always was, am reminded of is, you know, did, that, you know, how do you live your life in a way that takes care of others and that you're able to take care of each other? That's what my, that's what I learned. And so, um, so the ability to build relationships of trust, um, you know, having some love and uh, grace for people that just piss you off, you know, is really helpful. But, um, but getting, getting to build relationships within the institutions and systems and funders and policy wonks and getting them to know the community, the way the community lives. So I don't wanna change, you're not gonna change me. This is who I am. And for you, if you're gonna understand me the way I am, you're gonna do a better job in understanding community. And so I always try to, yeah, I know the community goes with me I owe the community that because that's what has given me my life. And so, um, and so the relationships that we all, everybody talks about relationships are really important for us to do the work for each other and for the communities that we represent. And, um, you know, I've known Michael and Alice for quite a while. And when Michael was, Michael asked me about this, you know, that, you know, we want to be community led. I'm like, fuck you, you're so full of shit. And so um, I was like, Michael, how many years have we been um, working and sitting around the same damn table with all of your BFFs up there in their ivory towers with their fat ass wallets? And then saying, here you go, here's some cookies, you know? And so, um, I just think, you know, I said, Michael, if then if you if if we want this to be community led, we need to be the boss. OK. And, um, you know, when I remember the press conference on the launch of CAO was here at the Taft building and uh, introducing Tony and Dow. And I said, so we have the King County executive and the CEO of Seattle Foundation about to kick off a coup. <laughs> You know, COO. So, um, so you know, I really just took this as the opportunity. Let me see if we if we really can take the weight of the community to help transform um, how funding happens. You know, this was the opportunity to do it. Um, were, did we get it right? Not all the time. <laughs> were we perfect? Hell no. But at least we were able to get. Um, the county to listen to community in a different way, the foundation, the Seattle Foundation to help strengthen their work in engaging community and partnering and to frankly, to model for other funders on how to do this work. And so, um, you know, we still have the hard conversations and, um, you know, I think it's, you know, how do we set this up for the folks who are come, gonna come behind us to continue and transform and improve um, and address, you know, um, white supremacy. How do we do this in an anti-racist, how do we make sure that we do this in an anti-racist way? You know, these are the kinds of things that we've tried to, I know was at the heart of the work of the community partners that were on the ground in the, in the dreaming and the visioning around what COO could look like. And, you know, I needed, Seattle Foundation to 
go in on King County sometimes and say, can you help them? <laughs> because they can't, you know, I feel like sometimes the institution is hard to change. Change is different anyway. But um, how do we help to change the way we talk to each other, the words that we use? Um, how do we stop labeling the community with the terms that we use within our institutions? How do we look at young people as, you know, our, our leaders, the leadership that is already in front of us and not ignore uh, voices of the youth? And so there's just a lot of work that, but that I, you know, I know in my heart, all of us, we're building on the work that came before us. And so how do we get back to accountability? How do we help to recreate transparency? But how do we, um, how, you know, really, how do we hold in our hearts? Um, how do we help the institutions and funders? How do we help them hold in their hearts the values that we bring as folks in the community? We all want the same thing. And we're not, you know, I don't think we're asking for anything that, that people have been asking for for generations. So um, it was just an opportunity to really get out of the box. We talk a good game in King County and the region, but you know, sometimes people's colors show when money gets into the mix, right? So how do we do this? You know, how do we, how do we partner with, with you know, big pockets in a way to, um, to help humanity be present? in our decisions, in our relationships, and um, in our work, so. Cecilia, so I'd really love to build off, you know, those comments you were just making about the how we do this. And I think you all did a great job of sort of walking the audience through the intention behind COO at the start of it, and what we really had to call the question if we were gonna do this intentionally and authentically. And, you know, as we've gone through, you know, the nine years since 2012, when this was just, you know, an idea of, you know, maybe Seattle Foundation, the county should try something new because what we've been doing hasn't been working. <coughs> you know, how has COO continued to try to center community in this work and ensure that those voices are, are driving the strategies and the work behind it? I mean, the, the formation of the governance group, the governance group, for those of you who don't know, the governance group was formed, um, was it in, was it an ordinance that was done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the governance group was actually created by an ordinance. The recommendation for the initial makeup of the governance group that came from the county actually had less uh, community, um, seats on it and we said oh we want this many and so we wanted the majority of the governance group to be people from the community and um, it was actually met with um, hardly any resistance so you know we we're looking for what are those opportunities that we could really put the voice and the leadership of community in the decision making roles so the governance group and you know we don't get we don't agree on everything either, but at least we can put stuff on the table and start to model for our partners, our institutional and and, and funders, um, how you can just have a real conversation without you know, yeah, without degrading people or humiliating. And you know what? Some of that also happens, but you know we also have a lot of. We also have a lot of respect for yeah. this body. Yeah. And, you know, I feel that if we, if we could get our partners, our institutional, our funders to understand kind of that element of, um, of, of how to be accountable, we're all broken to a certain extent. We all come with shit. We all come with issues. But one thing we all believe in is that communities deserve to lead the work. And so, um, so that's one of the ways that we're fighting for that to happen mm -hmm. as governance group mm -hmm. and really pushing the envelope with each other um, and, uh, and to keep that on the table. And so we also need young people to help us do that too. So- Well, well and, to, and to build on, on Celie's comment, um, just to go a little further with the governance group, mm -hmm. 
as Silly said, I mean, there, there is no, no controversy or, you know, pushback in terms of, I, I, if, if my memory is correct, you know, at least 51% of the governor's group has to be um, represent, uh, represent community, yeah. which means that for the funders, Seattle Foundation and county, you know, we have essentially one seat, one vote. And that's fine, um, which is what it should be. But there, there's something that both AJ and Celie brought up that I, I do wanna, wanna come back to and that kind of answers your question, Aaron. And, and there, is, there is something to say about trust um, and relationship. So the fact that Celie and I knew each other, you know, Celie could call me out and say, well, dude, like what, what? You want me to do this shit? Really? Come on, whatever. You know, it's like, I don't believe this. And if, you, and, all right, I tell you what, I'll do it. But if you, if you fuck me over on this one, I will come for you. <laughs> fair, fair, Celie, you should. Yeah. But Celie and I could have that conversation because there was love and trust there. And I, one of the things that really made this thing work um, and, and we know it's so important and we don't spend the time to do it, is building the relationship, building, building the relational so we can build trust, which allows us to do the transactional work and hopefully achieve the transformational work. Because if we didn't spend time with each other, and we spent a lot of time with each other, um, the, the funders spent a lot of time with each other, but then the funders and the governance group, you know, we, you know, all just us together spent a lot of time with each other. And as so we said, not everything went according to plan and we had debates and disagreements, but it was in a very safe space where we could push each other in that safe space and still walk out, you know, with tons of love and respect and with generosity for each other. And, and I do believe that, you know, like in any sort of, cross-sector, community-led, transformational effort, if we really spent the time on the front end building relationship in order to get to the trust piece, we could actually move things much faster rather than essentially kind of the basic bullshit that we end up doing now. Entity X um, tend, tending to be, you know, kind of white dominant led wants uh, to do X and wants, oh, well, we don't have time to do that. We want to enter the transaction you know, so we can get to the transformational and hence they never get to the transformational because they don't build a relationship or trust with community. And hence, once again, everyone's disappointed. Um, so it takes time, but if we can actually create that safe space with each other where we can, can push each other, um, challenge each other, and hopefully come up with something that is better than any of us would have come up with on our own, then we actually move something forward. Right. AJ, I want to make sure uh, we got some space for you to jump in here and talk a little bit about you know how you've seen community centered throughout this. Yeah, no, thanks, Aaron. Um, and yeah, just kind of uh, building off of what Michael said, I think part of that that the trust aspect too uh, that is especially needed given what CO is and how it's structured within local government. Um, it's unique in that there's this, you know, there's the power dynamic between local government staff, the foundation, but then there's also the, very much that political right. structure, right. right? That we have seen, um, you know, as BSK came into the fold a few years ago, played much of a bigger role, yeah. right? And I think that's where that institutional relationship and trust between the government staff, the foundation and community was critical, if not um, vital to the, you know, the success and the sustainability of this initiative. Yeah. Um, because that is something that I think sets COO, is, is a very unique in COO that we've been able to accomplish what we've been able to accomplish considering the political structure um, that everyone knows how complex that is. Um, but that's where the trust really became um, pivotal for, for us to do our work. And, you know, and this goes all the way into the kind of the nuts and bolts of what CO is in terms of getting the money out where, you know, community was centered in terms of, you know, for instance, I think I was part of the, um, 
I was part of the community panel when the learning community was standing up and we were looking at, and the county was looking at consultants, you know, inviting the community into that process to, um, to evaluate and, 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 uh, and rate kind of the, the organizations that were applying to be our, you know, to provide our support was critical. Um, and, and I know that happens in the policy and systems work. And, you know, I, I'm confident that that process is going to play out in the next iteration of, of COO. Um, but, you know, not like kind of what Michael said in terms of just putting out an RFP and having like the community was instrumental. And even going back, um, that design group, the co-design group, they, we, they were involved um, in developing what that RFP looked like for the first round of policy and system change. I mean, that was, I mean, that right there set the tone, um, Seely said, that as a model for other philanthropy and funders. Um, and I think that's one of the, one of the big things that CO can hold up is that it, be, it has become a model for other funders to look at in terms of just how they do our RFP processes. Um, which from a community standpoint is huge because that's what community has been saying for decades. And it was funny too. I remember those early conversations about the <laughs> <laughs> you know, The county again, and <laughs> the funders are having comments about, well, what about these outcomes? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, I'm like, shut up. The only thing we need to say, here's our priorities. Tell me your story. How are we going to get to these priorities, right? So, right. you know, how do we really simplify it? Because sometimes the we institutions and systems, and systems set up this fake standard for the community to achieve, and we really should be saying, "Okay, community, how do we how do we get where you are? How do we make sure that you are guiding where the work for us?" to make sure you have resources, to make sure you're, what you're doing there is driving policy and how policies get developed. Yeah. It, it really is. We really push to say, see all that great stuff that Feast is doing? That's what we want you to, you know, figure out the policy. Yeah. Put it in your own words, you know? And um, the community building that happens, um, you know, with the trusted advocates. That's, that impacts policy too. You figure out how to say, tell the institution how that translates. And so, um, because these stories are, that's the outcome the, and that's the leverage that we have. And uh, really that's the wealth that the community brings in really in the transformation to happen, our stories. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and you know, it's, it really is priceless. Yeah. How do you put a price on that? And so, um, yeah. Well, and, 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 and once again, just to add to what AJ and, and Seely said, the, you know, for the funders to, and it's kind of funny to say, because, you know, I, 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 I don't, I don't want to paint Seattle Foundation and the county as like some, you know, like patron saint, you know, of, right, of the two, right, yeah. you know? so like, I don't want to go that far, but, but there was commitment. There was commitment in terms of doing, doing things differently and showing up differently. And Sealy, I don't know if you remember, but I remember, I remember, you know, a number of meetings, you know, like, over the, uh, you know, Marco Polo, like, like, like we're meeting over there. And, 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 and I make a joke about it, but I mean, but there, but that piece of like not asking to come to Seattle Foundation's office, not coming to the county, we're coming out there. Let's find a place. All right, let's meet. So, um, I mean, I think it's things like that that once again kind of continue to to show, hey, you know, we're together in this, and you know, yeah. we those who control resources and 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 supposedly power, you know, and my scare quotes on that one. Um, can show up in a different way that actually kind of acknowledges that actually we most of the time we're making shit up as well. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, I have a story. Um, I won't call out names because um, I don't want to get in trouble. But um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I was it was with the I was working with the county and we had just um, 
gone through the RFP process for the first policy and system grantees. I think there were like 16 or 19. I can't remember. It was, oh. it's something around that number. And I remember it was myself and a couple other COO or county staff. It was, it was oh. staff. We went up to the eighth floor, which was the executive's floor in the, in the Chinook building. And we were presenting the, the list to, um, Dow wasn't there, but his senior staff was. And I distinctly remember the comment from one of the senior staff. And he was, mm-hmm. he was somebody who could have threw a wrench in everything. He was looking at the list and it was dead silent. And um, he was looking at it. And the first thing he said, he said, so we will, could be potentially funding organizations that are going to advocate against mm-hmm. county policy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I remember saying, I just said, yup. <laughs> and, uh, and then he, and then, well, yeah. Okay. So he, and then he was looking at it and he was, I remember leaning back in his chair and then he goes, okay. And mm-hmm. that, that was that. And I, that was, I, I distinctly remember that because again, that was a moment where um, kind of to Michael's point, there was a commitment there, right? That was easily a point in time where, the county could have maybe not reverse course, but definitely could have slowed down um, and, and created some panic in terms of, you know, what we were doing. But um, yeah, so um, there was definitely a commitment and a, a commitment to change the way uh, the county did business. So you've all talked a little bit about, you know, the intention behind COO and the vision at the start and you know, when you bring in this, you know, commitment to do things differently and center community voice in that process, uh, I know it's changed and evolved over time. So tell us just in your own words, how you're thinking about COO has evolved from, you know, when we set off to do this to where we're at now and the role that it plays. And I'll just open that up to whoever feels uh, like they have something to say. Well, I know for me, because I've had the um, privilege of being um, in COO, been part of the COO work and development, it's clear to me that I see some of the the impact the COO has had on other funders, on City of Seattle, on um, even at the state level. And so um, I know, and I've had the... um, you know, I've had people from out of state say, okay, communities of opportunity. Oh, okay, communities of opportunity. And so, um, but you know, the communities of opportunity that happened here in King County is not gonna be the same in San Francisco or Denver or DC. That's that community's opportunity. So um, there's this, I don't want anybody to get, you know, I think Michael was getting to this you know, this isn't about, you know, you know, pumping our chest and saying, Mm -hmm. yeah, we're bad. We're Mm -hmm. we're not bad. We're just finally doing what the community is asking us to do. The same thing, like your story, that's a great story. I never knew that, um, AJ. It's the same thing. We're we're fighting for change. (laughs) We're fighting for transformation. And um, here's an opportunity. Uh, And then with this, the fact that, you know, even within this pandemic allows us to push even more um, around things that we want to, that we want to change. And again, it's, this is, this is constant work. Somebody's going to have to come continually do this. Um, The next folks are, you know, who are going to come behind us. I, I hope we do them. I hope we do do them well and um, that we've done it in a way that other folks can be accountable to what we tried to put together and they make it better, frankly. And so, um, but I, I just think that for me, I see the influence of uh-huh. how we have lifted community voice to guide, to remind funders and local government that remember, you can't do this without community. And, um, if you aren't doing it with the community, that's does bullshit. So mm-hmm. I just, you know, I think people understand that more. Um, 
And, you know, I, I just, I see the fruit of the work yeah. of yeah. community. Yeah. So. I, I'm going to build on, on that, Celia. I'm, I'm a, I'm a gardener and I, um, the way I kind of think about CO is that, you know, it's the first seed that we planted. Yeah. And, you know, we took the time to actually, you know, water and fertilize and, 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 and then eventually got to a point where we could propagate um, the thing. Right. And when I think about where Seattle Foundation is today, um, and Aaron can attest to this, you know, in, in 2012, you know, it's like, oh, well, this sounds great. Let's give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And how it's influenced everything that we've done. And everything that we continue to do, yeah. um, and very similar to Sealy, you know, the conversations that I have with with other funders or um, with with other efforts um, uh, that are trying to model this in other parts of the country, um, you know, there 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 is something. I mean, and it is. It, it, and once again, I'm just going to mimic what Sealy said. The only reason why it, it feels innovative is because, you know, we finally came to our senses and actually figured out how to actually do this shit. Exactly. Because, I mean, it, it, you know, we should have been doing this 50 years ago um, and, and who knows where we'd be today. Um, but with that said, you know, when I, you know, when I think about kind of COO version two, when I think about, you know, almost every effort, it seems that that's happening in community right now, there, there always is some reference back to COO. Mm -hmm. How do you create truly a community-centric, community-led, community-directed initiative with, and, and, and one built on relationship um, that actually allows for, for things to move? We don't always get it right, but it's, it's better than what it, what, what it was. And um, I, you know, looking back, you know, over the past nine, 10 years, honestly, couldn't be happier with how things have transpired. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I, I think what also, uh, what is also a strength of ours is that from the governance group to the, I think to the organizations within COO and, and the county staff, um, it's a community of learners, right? And I think because like we don't have, you know, we're continuing to figure it out. And again, there's that foundation of trust because to learn you, you, you have to kind of find your way and you question things and sometimes you question each other. Uh, but it's that level of trust that keeps us moving forward. And, you know, I think where where it's going, you know, I, I, I have great optimism and hope too. I think we have, you know, this first iteration of COO and I'm kind of speaking from, uh, you know, one of the place-based sites perspective in SeaTac and Tukwila is we learned a lot. And, 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 and honestly, we would probably, we would do things differently. Um, I think we are better off than where we were for sure. Um, but um, I think the, the, the lessons learned um, it is invaluable in terms of how we continue to build the community that we want to see in SeaTac and Tukwila. And, and, you know, that is because of COO, that capacity, the resources that were brought there. Um, you know, like Celia was saying that Baltimore or, or DC and San Francisco are all different. Well, I'll venture to say that you know, the three place-based sites that we have in King County are different too, um, in, in various ways, right? And, you know, when, when Global to Local was, was, was funded and picked as a place-based site, four of our partners that are part of our coalition didn't even exist. Um, and so, so I think, you know, moving forward um, mm -hmm. into the next iteration of, of COO, we have um, a lot of we have gained a lot in turn from a community perspective and how we can grow together beyond COO, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was, you know, that was one of the, the motivations of, of, of the initiative, like Michael said, to use his gardening is to plant that seed in these local communities and see what grows, you know, um, from that. And, um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I see from, you know, how, my, how our vision is, I don't think necessarily our vision has changed. I think it's more informed 
Um, I think if anything, we have the opportunity now to be bolder uh, and push a little bit harder because we actually are saying, oh, we, we've kind of figured some of this stuff out and we're, we're making progress. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so now it's more informed than before when we were kind of just uh, finding our way. So, um, but I think our commitment to the original vision of COO is, if anything, is just, it's just emboldened. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll be quiet. Um, the, I think the main thing for all of, for this work is that, you know, all we're asking is for you to believe these communities. Yeah. We, I just want you to believe in me and that you will, you will let me do what I need to do to get this work right. And so, um, and just like anything else, young people are saying, you've got to believe me. And so we were in, I think we we're away at the, within the conversation with group health somewhere. Uh, it was a long travel. Um, <clears throat> but somebody said to me, one of the mucky mucks from group health says, so communities of opportunity, it's a great opportunity for a community. Yeah, no, it's a great opportunity for systems. <laughs> so um, that's the opportunity, the community opportunity is. Think of it that way. And so, um, you know, all, and that all goes back to, I, you know, I believe in the communities that are here throughout King County. Sometimes it may not, we, we, may, we may not understand the picture, but we know the, the meaning. Um, okay. this work. So, yeah. Thanks, Ely. I love that. Uh, so I got a couple more questions as a moderator, but then we're going to turn to Q&A with the audience. So I just want to encourage folks, you know, that are participants in the call, uh, use the Q&A feature to toss some questions in there. So we, we have some stuff for the folks when we, we get to that space. Um, I, I want to build off of one of AJ's comments. You know, you spoke of this being a community of learners and share with us some of those learning moments, you know, reflecting on the, the growth of COO over the years, what would you do differently? And I'll, I'll open that up to anyone on the panel. What would we do differently? Uh, the only thing that, that, that pops into my head, um, I mean, you know, it's all hindsight now, but um, we, 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 we launched out of the gate with, with our investments in place, White Center, Raider Valley, SeaTac, Tukwila. And then, you know, we, we came behind with um, our policy and systems investments. And not that I would have shifted, shifted that, um, but I mean, my colleagues know that I, I've been a, a huge um, uh, advocate for doing even more in policy and systems work. Um, You know, it's an interesting place for us to be of trying to bridge place and or cultural communities and what's happening there, but also knowing that we just don't have the resources to support every every community, be it place or uh, cultural, you you know, to to have a a communities of opportunity um, so my, my thought has always been that, you know, the more that we can invest in policy and system change, you know, we can get to many more communities and many more, more, more individuals and households, um, that are dealing with, you know, many of the same issues that, um, our place-based and cultural community partners are, are dealing with. Um, but I say that, and I say, I, I you know, it, to a large extent, you know, it feels like a kind of a minor, a minor thing, you know, could because right now we're actually doing some really great work in our policy and system investments that have been um, incredibly informed by what's been happening in place. So um, that's the only thing that pops pops into my head. I mean, I, I think there are probably some other maybe operational things that we could have done differently, but from a strategic standpoint, 
I mean, I've, I've always felt pretty good about what, what we've been, what we've been doing and how we've approached it. Yeah, from, um, and, you know, in the spirit of being candid and frank, you know, I, um, you know, I'll speak from uh, kind of the place-based site um, and kind of going back to what I just said about lessons learned and doing things differently um, is, you know, it's, and it's, again, it is in hindsight, but I, I would go back um, to, to when I joined Global the Local and, and spending more time building those relationships of our coalition. Um, you know, we were, you know, looking back, we were operating, I say we as in global to local, we were operating within the context of kind of the traditional like grantee and funder and timeline and, and, and that kind of thing. And so it was reactionary. Um, looking back, I, knowing what I know now as a, as a community, you know, as a community based funded partner, you know, I probably could have pushed back a little bit more in, 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 in telling the county and, and the fund and, and the foundation, like what we needed to do. Um, but, um, you know, again, that's in hindsight because we've made some progress in SeaTac and Tukwila, but if, we, you know, I, I guarantee it that if we would have spent the time building the relationships that we needed to build um, to, to get us, we, we would be farther, farther along. But that's a lesson learned that we're moving, that we're taking forward. Right. And, and, and part of it was because, uh, you know, uh, the, some of those organizations were a year or two years old and we're asking them to be part of this coalition and, and, and trying to align goals while they're just trying to hire staff. Right. And, and, and that was the reality. Um, so that's a, that was a lesson learned for, for us. Um, and um, I think we're stronger for it. We're you know, we can be a better partner for it. Um, but it is, it is probably something I would go back and, and do differently for sure. All right. So my last question for you all, uh, and you know, Celie, you spoke to, you know, the idea of a COO in King County is going to look different than a COO in DC or Chicago or Los Angeles or anywhere else. But if there are folks that are thinking about, you know, replicating this in another community, what advice would you share of them? Yeah, I think I, I think I said, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, the, the most important part is the communities, the connection and centering community around the development of something uh, of the, uh, their other, their version. Um, and then uh, if you center a community, you hear what the priorities are of the community. Um, you, you ask institutions, local government, you know, state partners uh, to be part of the work. Um, and then, you know, you work with other funders. Um, you bring more funders to the table. Uh, um, I mean, that's the, you know, cause it's all relational. All of this work is still relational. And so, but you know, I, it, it has to be centered around the community um, because uh, the communities know best uh, what their priorities are, um, what, the, what the struggles and challenges are and how to address them. So, uh, and then be prepared to do some funding, you know, policy, yeah, so. But you can't do it without community. Appreciate it, Zeely. Michael, AJ, any thoughts on advice for others? I think, yeah, I think Zeely just kind of nailed it. So nothing more I would add. Um, I would just say, I would just add in terms of, you know, any type of foundation or or local government looking to replicate or model, um, I would say that you got to own the mistakes or the shortcomings of, of previous efforts. Because I think at any time uh, some, uh, an institution with power and, and money comes in and wants to do great things, people 
organizations in the community have heard it before, right? So you you have to come in with what's what's going to be different this time, um, and owning those 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 past shortcomings is is critical to getting to that level of trust. All right. Well, thank you all for sharing so much guidance and wisdom throughout this conversation. We've got uh, a whole bunch of questions in the chat, and so uh, want to kind of uplift them for you all. There's there's a few that get towards just wanting to know a little more of what this looks like in practice and some examples. So I see there's a question around, you know, what do we mean by policy and systems change and what does that work look like in practice? You know, there's another of, you know, what does it actually look like uh, when community is centered and leading the work? And what are the examples of something that we supported in that space? I'll, I'll uh, tackle the policy and system piece and, and you know, Sealy, AJ, and even Aaron, you know, feel free to chime in. So the, the most simplistic way to put it is we're investing in place. So what happens in White Center with the 5,500 people who live in White Center is critically important. But we also know that there are many other people across the county that are dealing with the same housing, health, economic um, challenges. So it, essentially, when we talk about systems, it's what are the barriers that are in place for individuals and families and households to achieve the type of prosperity or health or housing outcomes um, that cut across geographic communities, racial communities, or cultural communities. So looking upstream and in terms of what are some of the policy barriers that are in place and where might there be levers that can then shift the systems that are producing the barriers that have always been in place. So, um, uh, you know, Aaron, you, you know, you've been closer in terms of some more of the more tangible things that we've, our partners have achieved in terms of um, the investment COO has made. But from that piece, you know, my colleagues have always heard me say this. I mean, I love White Center, but if all I did was think about White Center and not think about the impacts throughout the county, then we're missing, we're missing the plot. So we got to find ways of shifting policies and or shifting systems that are producing the inequities that we are seeing and been seeing for generations to get to different outcomes that go beyond just a geographic or cultural community place, but hit a broader swath of folks. Thanks, Michael. So a few more questions. You know, one came in around uh, what advice you have about how to success and build long-term relationships with organizations, you know, that may end up being competitors for funding, having similar mission, you know, investing in similar outcomes. You know, they notice that some organizations either don't want to do such work or are intimidated or worried about trying to build such relationships. Yeah, I can I can jump in on that one. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that you know that's a it's a great question, and I think that's where um, you know the place the coalition piece the the partnership piece is so critical, and 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 does take a lot of work. You know, it, you know I think that's one thing that CO has um, shed some light on in terms of a new way of partnering. And I'm just talking about within the community, um, what it actually really means to partner. It's not just calling somebody out and saying, hey, can I put your organization on this grant? Um, that it, what it really is to authentically partner with, uh, particularly with organizations that are in the same community that share, that serve the same population for the most part. Um, and, and maybe provide similar programming or services. Um, and so, you know, I just, I just go back and I know it sounds kind of a broken record, but really investing that time into the relationship and building that trust because the, the strength that you have are all those things that maybe you identified as obstacles. You're in the same place. 
you, you serve the same population, you have alignment or similarities around programming or services, those are actually all strengths. And so the, 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 the magic is how do you align the vision so that there is mutual benefit and sustainability mm-hmm. for both your organizations? Now that's, yeah, that's the hard part, right? And, and that needs those converse, that conversation has to happen with a level of trust that goes beyond being competitors. Um, but that is very real. And I think that is, where COO, you know, I think that's a big learning piece takeaway from that for, from the first few years is that in some ways we did COO kind of say, okay, here's play space, figure out a way to partner, but then we kind of let them partners figure it out for themselves, which I think was important. But I think, again, d- depending on place, depending on the dynamics and the history some coalitions need more support than others. And I think we learned that, right? And, um, and so with COO, I think there's that support there and that's getting better. But even without that, I think that's where the, the relationship and the trust really comes into play. Um, but it's, it's a great question. And I think um, it's, it's one of those things that we have to continually spend the time to learn reflect within our organization, how we are better partners, um, and then putting that um, out externally for, for our partners to, to collaborate with. So Celie, I got a question for you in, okay. in the, the chat. Um, you know, this person asks, uh, is the process really equal when Seattle Foundation or the county can stop funding or putting their money in? And how have you sort of managed that potential power dynamic. Um, is, the, is it well? The, this is I don't know. I, I don't know. Great question. Uh, one of the things that I'm always saying to people is that money is so disorganizing. So yes, the resources are great. Yes, we all need them to do the work. Um, but funders will come and go. And so I know for the you know for our work here in White Center, I guess any community, that's the story of nonprofit, is how do we build, how do we partner with other funders and systems to get the, what we need to do this work? They will, what's more, what's more important though, is how has this community's opportunity, how has this experience helped to make White Center stronger? And that when they walk away, the next funder will come, hey, I need you to do the work here and or support our work and I want you to do it this way. So it can't be about, um, well, it can be about the partnerships that we have with funders, but that the most important thing is how do we make sure that when they are gone and everything is said and done, they've created, uh, they've made it, uh, they've removed barriers to supports for communities. They've got us to do that. Um, and create more access. And hopefully that the next white center that COO goes to, that they've learned something from this white center. (laughs) And so, you know, it really is the, um, we have to be hopeful in this work and and to understand that that's the, the funding stuff, that's the game, that's the nonprofit game. So how do we do this in a way that really has helped to um, really um, center the values of what we feel feel are important to the communities that we represent? And then we have this model now for other funders to step into and for King County, for city of Seattle, for state annex, (laughs) for the state, we've created this model that we'd like them to step into and it'll morph and change too. Uh, I'm sure of it because communities also, they, they morph and change. So I hope that was helpful. Thanks for the question. So we've got a, a question from Noni. Uh, do you feel like the work that you've done will be sustained and what is necessary in order to sustain it? <clears throat> I think what's necessary is kind of, um, for us, we do a, a survey, a community survey that we'd like to do at least every two years. 
really going back to the original. When the CDA created, the priorities were um, access to livable wage jobs, strong schools, uh, affordable housing, and, and keeping a neighborhood safe. Those are the same priorities that is aligned with COO. So um, if those, and I, you know, the thing that's so funny though, is those four priorities, you would want them anywhere in King County. And so um, the, was it, how, did, how does it stay? Um, I think the most important thing is that how does the CDA maintain its accountability as community? And one of those ways is you hire people from the community um, and you partner with the folks on the ground who are doing the work and acknowledge their leadership and everything um, that happens in community. And so, um, and you're always looking to learn from, you know, from your partners. So that's one of the things that uh, is up to stay. Uh, the CDA, who, that'll be 20 years next, next year. <laughs> so. So Angela asks, uh, how are we addressing technology gaps and providing opportunities for community-led solutions in RFPs? I think this is really trying to get to, you know, how do we do funding in an equitable way? So I'm like, a, I'm tech challenged, so it's like, that question was like, okay, can you break it down some more? <laughs> yeah, Michael, maybe I, I can turn to you representing the, the funder in this space, but institutions and funders in particular often create a lot of barriers to community accessing funding. And what are some of the strategies Communities of Opportunity puts in place to try to mitigate and minimize that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, once again, you know, we, we've learned from uh, trial and error um, of being more responsive to the feedback that we're, we've been getting, we get from, from um, community. So when, once again, when we first started out, um, it, it was I, um, a different approach, but also at the same time, pretty limited in terms of what we were supporting. Um, but even as we, we, we thought about a lot of the policy and system work that we started to um, address, um, how we were doing that in partnership and, and getting, uh, getting a lot of great feedback from community about what were pressing issues um, within the, the strategies of, of communities of opportunity that should be, should be addressed. And then internally, you know, as funders, having the conversation of um, one of the easiest things to do is fund organizations that you know because of track record, because of capacity, but we, we also knew that um, there were many other organizations that were doing great work that weren't on our radar screen and or didn't have or may not have had the capacity of some of the, the larger, more established organizations. So it definitely took a lot of work on, on our end. And I, I, once again, go back to trial and error of um, making a commitment to um, uh, funding um, uh, organizations that um, were doing really incredible work, but maybe, I don't wanna say it was taking a risk, but just organizations that, that looked a little different to us. Um, and in many ways, I mean, once again, I think we have then seen kind of the impact of that, of those organizations who are closer to um, work in community have been incredibly productive in what they do and what they've done with their funding. And as importantly, have brought things back into, I, I would say the CEO family to help us understand more about what's happening in either place and or within our strategy areas of health, housing, and economic opportunity. So we are almost at time. Uh, so I'm gonna close out the questions and apologies for not getting to all of them, but encourage you to get a hold of someone on the team or staff if you have other questions. I'm happy to engage with you and kind of route them in the right places. 
Uh, before I turn it over to Roxana to close us out, I just want to offer a big thank you to Celie and AJ and Michael for, you know, spending some time with us, sharing us, sharing with us about the history of COO and all the, the blood, sweat, and tears they've been putting into trying to build this. So thank you all. Thanks. Good job, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And a shout out to you, Aaron, for moderating our first uh, speaker series. Thank you to you all so much for your authenticity, for being real, for being candid, and bringing all who you are um, to this discussion today. Um, I want to invite everybody um, to our next speaker series. This is actually one of six. Um, and the next two are actually about cultivating community imagination. Um, and, the, and the first one up is the new economy where we'll be talking about um, how our community has been engaging their imagination to reimagine land ownership and the new economy. Um, and so take, uh, you will be receiving a survey through the uh, email that you signed up for this event. Please take that survey as it will inform the time that we sh should uh, continue to have our speaker series at. So definitely encourage you all to take that survey to inform you know, when we, uh, when we will continue to see each other in the next five months. Um, and uh, again, for those of you who are curious about uh, COO, definitely join us so you can learn more about the work of COO. Mil gracias to everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us on this lovely summer evening. Um, please stay safe this weekend, drink a lot of water, care for your neighbors, care for yourself, care for the planet. Blessings, everybody. Take care, and we'll see you next time.